Excellent. So, welcome everyone. My name is Irina Murison. I'm the program, program director and moderator for today, as well as a researcher at IGD. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this discussion. From my side, a big thank you to our event partners, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in South Africa. And we will be recording the event and making it available across our social media platforms. So this discussion is also not chat and house rule. Please bear with us should we experience any technical difficulty. And if you would like to make an input, please make use of the, key, of the Q and A function. If you'd like to make a video and audio contribution, please look to the chat options and to put your camera on and unmute. If you would like to live tweet throughout the event, I'll be dropping the relevant tags on the chat box and to frequently remind our audience of, the, of these tags as well. But without further ado, let me introduce the Institute for Global Dialogue's Executive Director, Dr. Pilani Ntembu, for a word of welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ntembu. Uh, thank you, Arena. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, firstly, want to thank our panelists uh, who have sent uh, availed their time to join us uh, this morning. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our attendees who have also taken some time uh, to be with us uh, for our first installment of uh, South Africa in the world uh, for 2022. Uh, mine is just to give a little bit of a brief in terms of the Institute for Global Dialogue, in terms of our research and dialogue programs, um, a little bit in terms of um, just some of our project overviews, uh, and then maybe just a little bit in terms of our partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and then allow Arena uh, to go into South Africa in the world. Now, South Africa in the world is one of our flagship uh, uh, projects and, and programs as an institute. And a little, bit, a little bit about us. I mean, we are an independent foreign policy think tank. Uh, based in the city of Tswane in South Africa. And we seek to advance a balanced, relevant and policy-oriented analysis and debate and documentation of South Africa and Africa's global politics and diplomacy. Um, we strive to promote a broader understanding of the role of foreign policy and diplomacy in the pursuit of national and international development goals. I think if you look at all of our different uh, uh, publications and our previous uh, public dialogues and also our closed dialogues, you will notice that the theme of African agency in global politics is a recurring one. We like to look at global politics from an African perspective. We want to situate Africa within a changing international landscape and to better understand how Africa as a continent can enhance its agency in global politics. Another key thematic area you will find in our work is that of multiple track diplomacy. And here, what we do is we seek to consistently work with various stakeholders in foreign policy and international relations. Uh, that includes members of the executive, it includes uh, members of parliament who are working on international relations, and it also involves um, a wide network of think tanks and also civil society actors uh, who are involved in foreign policy. So the element of multiple track diplomacy will also come out quite consistently in the work that we do. Um, a lot of our work is organized around um, programs such as foreign policy analysis, geopolitical dynamics and governance, and also international diplomacy and we have a center for Latin America and the Caribbean. And um, just to give you an idea of some of the uh, various projects underway, including South Africa in the world, we're working, for instance, on issues such as geopolitical risk analysis. Uh, we're working on issues such as parliamentary diplomacy, um, charting a path towards a prosperous Zimbabwe and what role for South Africa and SADC. Um, we also work on subject matters such as an inclusive developmental fourth IR for South Africa, Africa and the BRICS. Um, and some of our colleagues are concluding work, for instance, on African perceptions of China's Belt and Road Initiative, the ANC's international relations, and also Southern African integration. Um, and lastly, 
all the issues that we work on also touch on various elements of Agenda 2063 and also the Sustainable Development Goals. We're very helpful uh, or very grateful rather for the support and partnership that we have with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. In fact, uh, those of you who have been following our work since the dawn of South Africa's democracy will know that uh, the FES is indeed actually our oldest uh, international partner when it comes to our foreign policy program. Um, so this partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is longstanding and we certainly um, look forward to ensuring that it continues, but only goes even stronger uh, moving forward. And they have supported consistently our work on South Africa in the world. And with this first installment of South Africa in the world, um, we're focusing on the topic of investment and foreign policy objectives. Are they fit for purpose? Um, we will be reflecting on these investment trajectories. And this is quite important, colleagues, taking into account some of the dynamics that are facing the country. Uh, we have the Zondo Commission uh, that has uh, uh, been published. There's key questions out there on what will the next steps be uh, following its publication, or at least the first part of its publication. Uh, we also have an important year for the governing party as it moves towards a national uh, general council, um, but also as it moves towards an elective conference. And that is surrounded also by challenges that have been facing uh, our various uh, state-owned enterprises and including certain black swan events, such as the July unrest in 2021. And with this in mind, colleagues, we have to ask ourselves whether South Africa has the capacity and the orientation um, to actually move towards a path that is both leads to additional growth, but also that attracts the right type of foreign direct investment. And this is something that is quite important. And some of the questions that I hope the panel will be grappling with is these approaches that are being adopted what impact will they have on people? What impact will they have on society? What impact will they have in terms of resolving some of the key challenges that the country faces, both socioeconomic, but also issues such as inequality? Um, and when we talk about investment, what type of investment are we talking about? What is the quality of that investment? I also wish to see also moving forward, that much of our discourse, especially because this administration has been focused on the issue of economic diplomacy, has been focused on attracting uh, foreign direct investment. But I think it's also important, also taking into account the attendees uh, here who come from a diverse background, some from the private sector, some from government, uh, some from the labor unions, uh, civil society, to also take into account a myriad uh, a number of voices that are putting in their input when it comes to South Africa's uh, trajectory. And this includes incorporating and strengthening of alternative approaches. And some of these alternative approaches include voices from heterodox and feminist economics um, and how these can actually impact, for instance, policy approaches. Uh, including also of alternative voices will also assist us in shaping the way in which the supposed dilemmas that we outline are being framed and are being phrased. In particular, how do we counter the austerity narrative um, and the idea of a debt crisis? Do we have a debt crisis? Uh, what is our idea of growth? And lastly, um, it's also going to be important to strongly qualify that cry for growth and investment so that as we look to attract investment, we also say investment at what cost. Um, so then the quality of the investment is exactly what I hope some of our panelists will also assist us in navigating through uh, this particular discussion. 
So with that, colleagues, I look forward to this panel discussion. I look forward to it informing some of the work of the Institute for Global Dialogue. And as I said, this is the first installment of South Africa in the world. There will be more coming up. And uh, with that, I wish to hand back over to our senior researcher, Arena Morrison, uh, who will take us through uh, the panel discussion and share it. Thank you, Arena. Thank you very much, Pilani. So as we've mentioned in our event today, we're going to be looking at these links between South African investment and foreign policy objectives. And what does fit for purpose actually mean? We're reflecting on 2021 and looking forward in this, in this year, 2022, and I mean, in the last year, we've seen various platforms where policy barriers are being discussed and new plans are, be, are coming into place, especially by Ramaphosa's presidency to expedite the process. Last year in September, IGD, um, together with Nkokeli Advisory and APSA hosted a Sunday Times National Investment Dialogue and discussed, you know, the economic climate and flagged issues of growth, as Pilani said, value chains, and to an extent, inclusivity in such a bleak outlook. But in this context, South African investment is often referred to or signaled as the kind of panacea to look out for, but how far does this go? Is there such a thing to holistic longevity to investment? And in terms of additional operational elements of making business work domestically and internationally, where does South African foreign policy value additions fit in? And when is it important to acknowledge the needs of several actors? Um, but with that, let me introduce our panel. We have Menzi Ndlovu, who is a senior analyst at Signal Risk. Mamo Keteli Jane, she is an investment strategy with APSA Capital and a columnist with Business Day. Diana Gaines, she is a CEO for Africa at Work and also head of the South Africa Nigeria Business Chamber in Johannesburg. And lastly, Peter Fabricius, who is a journalist with Daily Network. Let me hand over to Mr. Nlovu. What are your impressions about South African political economy and how does this factor into the risk environment? Thanks. Menzi, take it away. Just double checking you on mute. Greetings, Arena, and greetings to the audience. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at such a distinguished event. As Arena mentioned, I'm going to be giving a high level analysis of the political risks to investment in South Africa and effectively answering the converse of the topic of discussion today. Is South Africa fit for purpose? for investment. And I think it's quite ironic that uh, a conversation delving into and scrutinizing investment in South Africa comes off the back of two major investment announcements, uh, one pertaining to the green hydrogen economy and the other pertaining to the maritime economy. And I'm not a superstitious guy, but one would be forgiven for saying that the universe is trying to gazump us in some way. But I think it's important to keep our wits about ourselves and not lose sight of the reality of the investment climate in South Africa, which I believe is precarious at best. And I believe it's best captured by a footballing phenomenon. As you guys are aware, it's AFCON season. It's, uh, it's the season for football. And the phenomenon of own goals basically best encapsulates the investment climate in South Africa. And I think the story of investment in South Africa is one of persistent own goals. It's one that is typically characterized by self-sabotage, yielding a decisive initiative to our rivals and a general failure to fully capitalize on our comparative and absolute advantages that we had at the turn of democracy. Now, some folks may disagree and suggest that South Africa is doing just fine. And there are statistics to back such a position. For instance, uh, data by the World Bank suggests that net foreign direct investment as a proportion of GDP has been upward trending since 1979. There have been some fluctuations along the way, but the trend is up. And in 2020, South Africa accumulated the third highest FDI behind fellow hegemons in the continent, such as Egypt and Nigeria. And on the, pre, on the portfolio front, 
Um, Pre-pandemic investment saw a modest increase in 2020, despite the vaunted downgrade by Moody's in 2019. And for the RAND, while it has depreciated over the past five years or so, um, it, hasn't, it hasn't suffered the, the severe losses that have been characterized, or rather that have been experienced by peer currencies such as the Naira, the Kwacha, and the Shilling. So the question is, what is the fuss? I think the fuss lies in the fact that we are asking the wrong questions. We should not be asking where we are now, but where we could be and why we are not there. And in short, we could be an economic juggernaut with leading developmental and growth markers in the continent. And this rests on the fact that South Africa has it all. We have the prerequisites to be great. We have deep and well-established markets, a strong infrastructure base, interconnectivity with regional and global markets, diversifiable and plentiful resource endowments, and a pool of great intellectual capital. We have the smarts. But the problem is, ladies and gentlemen, bad politics and political risks continue to be our own goal. They continue to undercut the domestic economic climate, and they continue to deter the kind of investment and the magnitude of investment that is required to unlock and expand our economic potential and to bring us closer to our developmental goals. Now, there are three key political risks to investment in South Africa, all of which are interrelated. The first one is administrative efficiency. Now, while the cost of registering a business is particularly low in South Africa, it's well established that businesses and investors face death by red tape, death by administration. Things like acquiring operating permits, getting access to utilities and fulfilling tax obligations are unnecessarily arduous. And we are outdone by much smaller economies such as Rwanda and Mauritius, which have got these processes to a minimal and a T. And I think South Africa's administrative inefficiency is encapsulated by the famous phrase, the system is offline, which you're likely to encounter at almost every departmental office. Now, the reality is this is a low hanging fruit and one which requires a very small amount of political will to resolve. But because of political calculations, we have allowed this fruit to spoil and undermine investors especially or rather investment, especially smaller scale investment. The second political risk, and I think this is much more of a consequential one, is stale and sluggish leadership, policy making and implementation. Now, how long, I ask you, how long are we going to keep on recycling the same policies and catchphrases under different names? How long are we going to delay integral reforms? And how long are we going to have for not, 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 not to disrespect the folks out in power, but gerontocrats running portfolios that are integral to the country's future, as opposed to youths that are much more attuned to the needs of the future and how the global political economy is evolving. The reality is South Africa needs fresh ideas and not the reclothing of old policies such as Gia and, and Gypsa and Asgisa under new names or the recycling of old heads in portfolios that require forward thinking, energy being a case in point. And the necessity of reform, especially when it comes to state-owned enterprises and fiscal spending is clear. And again, shortcomings in all these imperatives boil down to political consideration, including marriage to outdated ideologies and the use of political office as an incentive and reward. Now granted, this is somewhat unavoidable in a competitive political environment, but we should look to optimize our decisions and our appointments even within these constraints in order to maximize investment. And the final political risk to investment is, is one that has become very pronounced of late, and that is political strife within the ruling hierarchy and insecurity. Now, historically, Balancing or competing interests within the ANC and the broader tripartite alliance has manifested in policy inertia. We've been slow to implement necessary reforms. We've kept on recycling cadres to different portfolios, irrespective of turgid performance in others. However, 
in July, we saw that the frictions within the ruling party also pose an acute security risk, which investors have become heavily sensitive to. And more recently, this has been peaked by incidents targeting national key points, such as the fires at Parliament, the Justice Department, and more recently, the Waterkloof Air Base. And of concern this time around is the fallout from the state capture report, as, as, as noted by the doctor earlier on, and the ANC or events rather surrounding the ANC's electoral conference. Now, not to sound like a Ramaphosa acolyte, but should there be another outbreak of unrest or a new ANC president come 2020, we could see a substantial and perhaps the most significant amount of divestment and disinvestment yet as signal by stakeholders in the market. Now, the interesting thing is that political stakeholders are aware of these risks. We saw Ramaphosa come out after the Dikhutla this weekend talking about some of these risks and repeatedly we, we see remarks that suggest that political power brokers are aware of them and they're aware of how crucial it is to optimize South Africa's political environment, which remains the foremost impediment to the country's economic potential, all right? Leaders know that South Africa cannot simply go it alone, but they also know that it's important to make South Africa's investment case as appealing as possible to investors. But the problem is this economic imperative has been substituted, all right? It has been deprioritized in favor of short-term political expedience and own goals. Now, the question is, in 2022 and in the near future, what will stakeholders opt for? All right. Long-term political gains or rather long-term economic gains that might necessarily require some sacrifices and some pain in the short term, but are maximally rewarding in the future? Or will we sacrifice our long-term economic future for political expedience and continued own goals? I know what I'd opt for. I'd much rather opt for the former. Thank you. Thank you so much, Menzi, for that. And I mean, listening to South Africa fit for purpose and, and maybe the approach thus far has been, maybe there is a meritocracy to the gerontocracy um, timing of, of what leadership means to, to South Africa. Maybe that has been approached, maybe that is not, no longer fit for purpose. But I would like to hand over to Mamokete and in that, I mean, I read your Business Day article this morning and I'm gonna be dropping the link in the chat, uh, but in the context of what Menzi has sketched out for us, what are the kind of conversations we should be having about, for example, debt and the environment that we, that we find ourselves in? Okay. All right, now I just have to. Uh... Unmute. Can you hear me? Oh, you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it, this, is, this is such a big, it's a big topic. Um, and I'm trying to try, try and pull out some of the nuances uh, because I think um, often people go back and say, well, either you've got the fiscal space to do X or you don't, um, or um, you, know, you need to make a choice between investment. Um, and and if, you, if you have austerity, austerity means that you're not spending money on anything. And I think it's a lot more complicated than that. I'd like to just go back, take a step back and talk about what is the kind of investment that the country um, needs if I think about it from my perspective. There's obviously other perspectives out there, but the way I would think about it is to say, you know, in, in terms of the type of in infrastructure that you want, um, especially the type of infrastructure that the state gets involved in, what you would like to do is something that is transformative. Um, so somewhere where you can get the most mileage out of um, the least effort. So something that is actually going to transform um, the, the economy in some fundamental way that improves competitiveness over time or um, even over the short term. Um, and that's gonna put you on a higher growth trajectory. Um, and I mean, the, 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 there's a provocation that was put forward around um, how do we define growth? I think from my perspective, we talk about a lot about growth and I agree that some growth is not necessarily welfare enhancing. Um, so I would say within that scope, you're also looking for um, welfare gains. Um, 
So that, that's the first thing. The, one, the second thing I think which is related is growth that has got a very high multiplier. So growth that crowds in other types of activity or investment that crowds in other types of investments and other types of activity to the maximum um, that you can get. Um, and often um, in South Africa at the moment because of the fiscal constraints to some extent, I suppose, is um, growth that, that crowds in the private sector. So if you're going to do um, an infrastructure project that then is going to lead to um, infrastructure investment around it, um, you know, that, that's probably going to be um, first price because then the multiplier from what government does to what ultimately results in terms of economic activity can be quite high. So I would say those are the kinds of um, in, in investment that you'd like to, you'd like to see. And I think um, historically this government has not been particularly bad at doing that kind of investment. So if you think about, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, investment in dams, for instance, that's the kind of, uh, the kind of investment that has multipliers. What we have had though, um, recently, and I mean, this uh, is shifting back to the implementation as well as the funding um, of infrastructure is that the big um, arms of the state that were responsible for a lot of this big infrastructure, that would have been your ESCOM, um, that would have been your um, Transnet, your SUNRA, your AXA, etc. cetera, uh, you know, got derailed to some extent uh, by state capture. I think Menzi spoke quite a bit about that. Um, and within that context, then you've seen quite a big decline um, in um, government or state um, state um, 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 infrastructure expenditure in the past five years or so. So where before um, you saw these kinds of entities ramping up, um, the sort of like policy inertia, um, the repurposing of um, of those institutions for other other activities. Um, um, that, that are not related to their core mandates, uh, et cetera, have led to these being um, not as efficient as they otherwise would have been. And, and they were really um, strong uh, implementers of especially rolling out economic infrastructure because they were both able to fund the infrastructure as well as to, uh, to actually execute on, on, on the investment mandate. Um, and all of this happened outside of the fiscus. Uh, where now, um, you know, over time, these entities have had to rely more and more and more on state support because they've been um, run inefficiently um, and as a consequence are becoming a drain on the fiscus. And it's sort of like gnarling up, um, you know, the, the implementation of infrastructure investment. Um, But in terms of what we do in the future, I mean, I think I've spoken a bit about the recent past, but in terms of what we would do in the future, um, there, there, there's, there's, there's quite a few things that are transformative um, that are currently on the, on the table. Um, um, you know, if you think about the green transition, for instance, that is definitely one of the things that is um, a global, um, you know, a global um, effort, um, so to speak, um, of which South Africa is part. And I mean, this speaks to investment in energy, um, and it speaks to both the technology as well as the funding thereof. And again, um, this is something that can be done um, in a way that has minimal impact to some extent on, um, on the fiscus, at least in so far as cash transfers themselves are concerned. Um, so I think that is one of the things that we're looking at. The other one, I think, um, if I think about on the, off the top of my head that I would like to see a lot more of, um, and it comes and goes as, a, as an idea, is the one on regional integration. Um, I mean, that has got the potential to be hugely transformative uh, for the region and for South Africa. Um, and I think, um, you know, Transnet has spoken um, on and off about, uh, you know, uh, extending rail infrastructure, um, you know, integrating the transport, um, the transport nodes um, regionally better, or at least integrating South Africa better into existing transport nodes and, um, and, and investing in those. Um, and then the other one, I think that speaks to, you know, social infrastructure now is, um, is, is around spatial transformation. So um, we speak a lot about, um, you know, how South Africa works, the fact that you have these distances, um, you know, the special um, 
apartheid special planning that needs to be dismantled in some way. Um, and I think we've, we've seen stops and starts um, around that, getting cheaper transport, um, et cetera. Um, and those have been frustrated, I suppose, by administrative um, constraints um, as well as um, corruption within the entities that, that, that would be responsible for, for getting this done. So, you know, when we speak about financing, and I think I've spoken a little bit about this, um, I think it's a nuanced topic. So financing depends very much on um, the kind of infrastructure that you have, because the kind of infrastructure will dictate to some extent the kind of funding that is available for, for, for that infrastructure. Uh, but it also does also depend um, on, on the state of the fiscus. Insofar as um, the state ultimately has to um, you know, provide guarantees, even if it's not direct transfer. And for social infra infrastructure, it's actually, um, it, 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 it involves um, actually direct transfers. So I don't know, um, and I don't really believe that um, the fiscus itself is per se, a particular constraint to infrastructure investment. Um, you know, in fact, it could very well be the case that if you can mobilize um, infrastructure investment via more efficient planning, better policy implementation, you would actually um, increase the growth, um, at least the potential growth of the economy, which allows you more fiscal space. So it, it's, it's not as straightforward as you have austerity, therefore you shall not spend because there's certain types of expenditure that are necessary for growth. And for those, you probably can raise the funding and uh, be rewarded by, uh, by getting better, um, better market access. Um, and, I, and I think my, my final point, the final point that I'd like um, to make on, on, on this is that, um, you know, if you, if, if you look at, you, you can get the market to do what the market can, as far as infrastructure is concerned, you free up the space to do more like healthcare, uh, roads, et cetera, that kind of infrastructure as well, which I think um, uh, is one way in, in, is in one way in which you do it. And then the other, the other points um, as a very final, final, final point is that if you look at um, what government has chosen to spend money on, so if you look at the actual budget, a lot of the expenditure um, increases that you've seen on the current side, so going towards wages, et cetera, um, has been uh, at the expense of capital expenditure. So the quality of state expenditure itself needs to shift a little bit more. So you spend a lot more, um, a bit more on infrastructure, a lot more on infrastructure, and a lot, a lot less on, um, on current expenditure in some way. So that rebalancing has to happen. Um, so on, in a nutshell, the fact that you are fiscally constrained um, does not, to my mind, prevent you from um, investing in infrastructure. So that'll be my five cents for now. Thank you so much, Mama Kete. I really appreciate how you are looking to regional integration specifically and how that, that is actually drawing a very realistic connection to what South Africa needs to do in order to capitalize or tap into further engagement um, or, or rather improved engagement. And I mean, when we talk about the issues of planning specifically and operationalization, I think these are issues that keep coming back. Before I hand over to Diana, I would just like to make everyone aware of the uh, poll that is going to be launched shortly. There we go. Um, this is just to gauge your impression. What do you think as the audience are, are barriers to South African investment specifically? But let me hand over and let me ask specifically, I mean, Diana is a wealth of information in terms of South Africa's bilateral investment engagement in Africa. Um, can you take us through some of your impressions and experiences? Thank you so much. Um, all right, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. And um, what I'm gonna do is maybe just take a step back because I think it's important to set South Africa in the context of the continent. Um, and this has been quite, in some ways, a fraught relationship. It's possibly beset by um, a lack of, um, of kind of strategic engagement uh, and, and, and actually has not realized its potential at this stage. And this is important to note, I mean, given that we live in this um, era of increasing uh, regional uh, regionalization with the African free trade area, et cetera. So, you know, the question is, does Africa matter to South Africa in terms of its own national interest? The answer has to be yes, when we are in, in, inextricably bound together. Have we done it well? Well, that question, the answer to that is, is much 
less clear. I mean, Africa has always been at the heart of the ANC's foreign policy focus. Um, you know, it's just the, the implementation has often been um, not optimal. Um, South Africa did have, and, and certainly in the, in the, after 1994, there was a lot of excitement in the rest of Africa about um, what potential the country had to, to really develop um, uh, like a center of excellence for Africa and for Africans, drawing um, top professionals from around the continent to live here, to contribute, to attract um, investment from, from other African countries. But this doesn't, has not really happened. And that I think that door may have closed for the moment. Um, and just in general, the government has battled to set the right tone <clears throat> in its foreign policy since uh, 1994. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that history matters. And if you look back at that at that period, um, instead of embracing the leadership role as the size of South Africa's economy, of size of the country, its global standing at the time, et cetera, it shied away uh, from that for fear of being regarded as a regional hegemon and emphasized the need to build partnerships. And that's important. Of course, that was that was obviously something it needed to do. But, uh, but it, at the end of the day, it didn't really help because many other African countries felt South Africa was just hiding its actual continental leadership ambitions, um, which came through in, in different ways, policy missteps um, in the pan-African agenda of President Mbeki, et cetera. Um, and, and, and some of the issues were not actually of South Africa's own making. This, um, the G20, uh, Europe, and, and, and various other regions courting South Africa, um, believing that South Africa had significant influence within Africa, fueled partly uh, by the, 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 the notion of South Africa as the gateway into the rest of Africa, which was <clears throat> quite a strong narrative for, for some time, given our, our very strong uh, infrastructure and, and uh, financial systems, et cetera. But this wasn't a view shared by, by other Africans. <clears throat> and also what's changed is South Africa's economic heft in those early days was largely premised on the relative weakness of other African economies. That's no longer the case. Um, you've got fast growing uh, countries across the continent um, and, and we have a lot of infrastructure building, a lot of regional infrastructure. You're seeing, for example, with the ports, um, even as Durban port has been besieged um, with different problems over time, people are finding other ways to get their goods off, off the continent from South Africa and elsewhere in Africa. So, you know, we, I think the, the point I'm making is we have to fight that much harder for relevance than we used to have to do, um, say, 10, even 10 years ago. Um, and then another a major weakness in terms of, of this relationship um, at some level is the, is the is South African, is, is the lack of cohesive, um, of a cohesive business government kind of um, front resulting from a mistrust between the government and business at home. And this has played out similarly in the region. You're not, it has undermined the economic diplomacy potential of, of South Africa. Um, and, and there's reasons for that, you know, the racial makeup of, of a lot of business that has moved off the continent, uh, across the continent, et cetera. But also what has happened simultaneously is you're getting all these other countries and companies from other parts of the world who are, are diving into, into Africa and setting up relationships, investing in the continent, you know, from China, from the UK, traditional partners, um, France, which is doing a very big Africa push at the moment, despite the, the, the lack of a welcome they're now feeling in Mali at the moment. <clears throat> and, um, and, they, and, they, and they're courting business, they're courting big business across the continent. Um, and, and basically, uh, so we're not leveraging um, commercial advantage for our companies through soft power and proactive economic diplomacy. Um, so that, that has been, and, and South Africa, you know, growing um, business expansion across the continent is good for the South African economy because it does, um, there's a lot of investment in, in that push um, go, going out, you know, in terms of, of, of product and skills, et cetera. So, um, and then there's, I think one of the biggest things in terms of this is, and it's something, it's not a business thing directly, but it actually is a business thing, an investment issue, is the, the poor handling of xenophobic attacks in, in, in South Africa, certainly in the earlier uh, stages of that. And this has badly dented South Africa's image in Africa. In my role as the chamber or as a, as a, um, a, a consultant in the rest of Africa, this is probably the issue that is most often raised with me is like how how do we trust south africa what why should we take our money to south africa why should we invest there <clears throat> you know when when we don't feel welcome and and, and moving money and, and attractive investment is is really about feeling welcome um, at some level 
So, so what we found is it's been very difficult for, uh, or, or we've not seen other Africans uh, investing in South Africa. And there has been a sense in South Africa that, that there isn't much money in the rest of the continent, that the money is kind of somehow housed mostly in South Africa. And that, of course, is not the case. Um, I know that the stock exchanges, the JS, JSC has tried to attract investors um, onto its board and, and that hasn't worked for the same reason. There's a, South Africa has not been good at two-way relationships, whether that's been in, in business or, or in, at a political level. Um, you know, that said, I think uh, 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 President Ramaphosa was recently in, in West Africa on, a, on, a, on state visits to five different countries. Uh, I was in Nigeria for his, his uh, stopover there. Um, and, and I think the, for the first time, I, I, it seemed a less of a us and them meeting than it has in the past, looking from the outside, certainly. Um, and I think that he had a very different message um, relating to the Omicron uh, virus, which uh, uh, came through just about just before his visit and really uh, emphasized the message of, of um, Africa versus the West, you know, slamming the West for travel bans, et cetera. And this was a message that that seemed to really resonate across the, the during these visits. Um, and, and I think this this. Um, there was a lot of uh, positive uh, publicity about that trip. So that sort of opens the door to show, well, how do we, how do we um, change this narrative? And it does, leadership matters. We do need these relationships driven from the front. Business will continue regardless, but businesses' relationships in Africa, rest of Africa would be a lot, you know, would, would be boosted by strongly and proactive leadership at a government level. But I mean, how do we do that? You know, can, uh, South Africa is looking increasingly at local content issues here, which may exclude other investment in South Africa uh, from other parts of the world and also from the rest of Africa. You know, we have BEE, which a, a lot of Africans also raise. They feel they don't have these requirements for uh, for South African companies going into their markets. But if they come here, they will have to adhere to these to these um, to this legislation. Um, and also migration, you know, the, this continues to be an issue, and we're seeing it coming up um, in, the, in, in South Africa of late with this um, anti, kind of a, a rising anti-foreigner sentiment, um, and, and what is going to be the socio-economic impact of that? It should be a vital foreign policy issue right at the top of the agenda in South Africa, but actually the government has proved to be fairly coy about this issue and not really wanting to tackle it head on. You know, we have problems for Africans getting visas to South Africa. We can't be selling South Africa as an investment destination without making all of those things easier. So I would say just in closing, South Africa is still a significant player in Africa. There's no doubt about that um, and a strong investment um, destination. But there are so many issues that threaten to derail that. And I think that that is something that, that you know, other, other panelists have discussed that, that really needs to be acknowledged and looked at. Um, taking, the government needs a, a strong, hard look at that. We don't exist in a bubble. And, and so, uh, you know, we are part of Africa and this is something that needs to be addressed. So a little bit off the, the main topic of the um, fit for purpose Purpose, but I, I hope that's added some value. Thank you. Absolutely. I think this, this, this is such a nuanced perspective that we are trying to, to investigate here. So in going a little bit off, off the topic and including a number of issues, I mean, especially noting the rising anti-African sentiment, that is a major, that is a major um, deal for South African foreign policy to deal with, uh, especially but let me hand over to Peter Fabricius, our last panelist. He is a veteran journalist in international relations and always, as always, looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, Peter, you, you wrote, I think it was this year or last year, you wrote a paper about what fit for purpose means. Take it away. Thanks so much. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Irina and IDD and Frederick Hubert Stifting for this and for inviting me. Yes, I, my topic today is is foreign policy, really, in, in the context of investment and the for, and, and do we have a foreign policy, or how, how we could have a foreign policy um, and an economic policy, uh, economic diplomacy that's that's more uh, fit for purpose. And and as you. It's, uh, it, it's kind of based on um, on a paper that I did uh, for the Brenthurst Foundation last year. So, I mean, basically, if you look at the, 
the, the past three decades globally, um, after the Cold War, um, as globalization has taken hold, economic diplomacy has increasingly become a priority of foreign policy of most countries. But South Africa has not been as enthusiastic. Much of the reason I suggest has been a kind of uh, ideological skepticism about neoliberalism taking over the, wo the world. Um, some influential ANSI thinkers have disparaged economic diplomacy as mere economism or economic determinism. Uh, and that they, in their view, South Africa should r raise its foreign policy goals to much loftier um, aspirations like African solidarity and so on, which was, as we heard, very much uh, President Thabo and Becky's focus. More recently, the economic diplomacy has risen higher in the rankings in South Africa's priorities, foreign policy priorities, and certainly in that of Cyril Ramaphosa, who I think has synth synthesized it with Mbeki's Afrocentrism to promote, for example, intercontinental trade through the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and through bo boosting regional infrastructure. Yet despite these efforts, most commentators, I be think, believe that South Africa still suffers from too little economic diplomacy, both in quantity and quality. You know, the so-called 2019 Pahad, re Pahad report chaired by former Deputy Foreign Minister Aziz Pahad recommended a much more focused economic diplomacy including systematic mapping of economic opportunities in foreign countries, mobilizing South, Africa, mobilizing South African business to help formulate foreign policy and quantitative evaluation of performance of embassies and ambassadors and economic diplomacy. Some of this is happening. Uh, you know, diplomats at DOCO are given more economic modules in their training, especially their preparation for foreign postings. But many believe this doesn't go far enough and should go, uh, include a much more thorough grounding and applied economics to focusing on um, economic aspects most relevant to their functions. Uh, and, you know, in the case of outgoing ambassadors to their particular markets that they're being posted to. Um, one of the major obstacles to such economic diplomacy had, has been the ANC's rather debilitating practice of using embassies as havens of patronage or dumping grounds of disguised unemployment, as somebody once put it, for disgrace to otherwise superfluous politicians. This policy peaked under President Zuma when over 80% of South African ambassadors were political appointees rather than career diplomats. But the practice continued to a lesser degree though under Ramaphosa, who has often also used foreign postings as dumping grounds for inconvenient zuma line cabinet ministers, for example. And anyone who thought this practice had passed would um, should read the minutes of the ANC Deployment Committee, which Judge Zondo released with his first report on the State Capture Commission recently. They revealed that the party is still happily carving out ambassadorships for failed politicians. And if one considers that this committee was also, in effect, appointing judges to the Constitutional Court, it should come as no surprise that mere ambassadorships were obvious pawns of party patronage. You know, if one looks at uh, the state of uh, the ANC at the moment, the huge divisions and the, 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 the kind of so-called insurgency last year, uh, general uh, signs of, of implosion, it's perhaps not surprising in a way that, that uh, Ramaphosa would do that. But still, it does have an, a long-term impact, I think, on economic diplomacy, on investment and economic performance. Apart from deploying more knowledgeable people and fewer di political di uh, appointees, a better foreign policy should also align the number and location of South African foreign missions more closely with its economic interests. Closing missions, uh, re reducing staff, appointing people as ambassadors to a range of countries, as, of as many countries do here. Um, and it also should embrace uh, South Africans outside government, especially business, much more closely in the formulation and even implementation of economic foreign policy. It would also focus more on improving its own government, the government I'm talking about now, and in pro providing practical assistance to traders, investors, and manufacturers, and less on ideological point scoring. Some of South Africa's big global economic initiatives are certainly worthwhile, such as the advocacy of the G20 and elsewhere for an equitable international tax system where companies pay taxes where they do business and not in tax havens. But other initiatives seem more, seem more rhetorical. I, I know this is controversial, but if one takes South Africa's campaign for a wave of the, the WTO TRIPS agreement, which would allow South Africa, India, and 
other developing or emerging countries to simply seize the patents of pharmaceutical companies and manufacture other COVID-19 vaccines free of charge. One has to ask whether this is something of a, of a, of a kind of a, an ideological touchstone issue rather than a practical effect. The, practi the more practical alternative, which some ph pharmaceutical companies like Aspen, Pharmacare, and BioVac are already pursuing, and it seems quite effectively, is negotiating mutually beneficial licensing agreement with the likes of Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer to make these vaccines in South Africa under license. Many current and former diplom uh, DERCA and trade department officials believe, as one of them put it, that we're too obsessed with writing a good summit declaration in two weeks when companies want to talk, walk into an embassy or the DTRC campus and need direct assistance for practical things. An obvious way of improving economic diplomacy then would be to merge DERCA with the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Australia did that in 1987, and it's generally regarded as having been a huge success, greatly boosting trade. New Zealand, Canada, and others had, had done the same. This would create the South Africa Inc., which everyone champions, but which is not really happening. This would help South Africa to compete against more joined up, efficient countries like Australia and China. It would infuse a whole lot of the economic skills into foreign policy directly, and also more readily harness business as a partner, not as an enemy which is often now the case. Um, many believe though that uh, diplomatic impediments are frustrating this endeavor. There was some talk that it was going to happen when, when, uh, when Ramaphosa reshuffled the cabinet in 2019 and it didn't. And the, 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 the general consensus is, was because of strong resistance from trade and industry. You know, whereas merging trade and foreign affairs worked in Australia because it embraced free trade and globalization, it might not work in South Africa with a government that regards globalization with some suspicion. Uh, and it is implementing a, tr implementing a trade strategy that subordinates trade to government micromanaged industrial policy, which uh, Diana also touched on. We are now going further down that path with industrial policy policies that include restrictions on exports, likely increase in import tariffs to boost specific local industries. These risk incurring backlashes from trading partners as they would transgress World Trade Organization free trade rules, or they could. Um, and so in, in, if, if we look back in 2015, we saw South African exports of autos and industrial and agricultural products to the US very nearly big, take a big hit as the US President Barack Obama provisionally suspended South Africa's GOA benefits in, uh, in retaliation for South Africa, raising import tariffs on US meat. Many believe for a range of, of reasons related to these, these policy uh, uh, decisions uh, and, and their trade impacts that we will not be in a GOA after 2025 if it is extended at all. In short, I would suggest that uh, it would be more beneficial in the long run if we obviously subject business to, to the, the due re, uh, regular, re, regularization um, uh, and, and you know, regulation, the monitoring of its performance and the environment and with labor and so on, but that we give a, a freer reign to business people to ultimately make their own commercial decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I think I think what's interesting. Let me let me share the the results to the poll in the meantime. We've, I mean, just taking from what Bensi has said, we're looking at issues of self sabotage. Then Mama Peter mentioned that fiscus is actually not our problem, not right now. If I can add in, in in brackets, and Diana mentioned, you know, needing to maintain relevance, and that's South Africa's engagement. There is no other way to look at it, but that it must be a yes. Um, and, and even the anti-African sentiment and how government has chosen to tackle it um, in its coyness. I mean, we are looking at incredible uh, political dynamics in this case. And I want to uh, stop sharing the results of the, the barriers and rather send out another poll in terms of what you think meaningful investment is. Uh, we are going to get to the questions and answers shortly if they are coming in. And while I correlate them, I just want to ask my colleague, Sanusha Naidu. She is incredible when it comes to looking at a number of dynamics. And Sanusha, I want to ask you, 
what does meaningful investment mean to you? And if you have any other questions as well. Um, thank you, Rina, and good day, colleagues. And thank you, uh, panelists, for a fantastic presentation. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's so much of information to absorb. And I think it's been really rich in terms of identifying the, the push and pull factors, the drivers, um, and contextualizing South Africa's foreign economic engagements. I think, Diana, you've provided a very important sketch around some of these dynamics in terms of where South Africa was post-1994 and where South Africa is today and what has been a changing landscape in Africa. And of course, Omakefi, I think the question of infrastructure is so key if you look at other investors in the continent, but you also look at other countries that are using in, uh, infrastructure as an investment trajectory and how do you get it right? And you know what, what, what do you free up space for so the market can actually absorb and, and invest in the kinds of spaces? So the constraint of the fiscus is not always has to be a negative one. It can find the, the right formula. And then, of course, with, with, with Peter and, uh, and Menzi, I think the challenges around um, implementation and operationalization of South African foreign policy, but also the economic uh, diplomacy concept and, and, and the articulation of economic diplomacy. I was actually fascinated by, and I want to raise this with, with, with all the panelists, if they can comment on this, is um, if I, memory serves me correct, the president did not have his investment conference last year. You know, he has this big investment vehicle where he's basically bringing in uh, investment through this investment vehicle. And last year, uh, if my memory is correct, he never have had that conference. And so how important it is in this year, given the political dynamics at the domestic level and the confidence that perhaps the investors need to look at in terms of this investment conference. And what are some of your impressions that you think um, will happen in this kind of very important year in terms of uh, the, the, the domestic political landscape and, and the party and so forth. The other point to, to ask is on legislation again, uh, legislation in parliament, which also causes um, investors to become nervous. Um, I can give you three. Uh, Diana mentioned local procurement, there's the Employment Equity Act, there's the Companies Amendment to the Companies Act. And then of course, there's the whole question around the land, um, expropriation of land without compensation, which now it seems to be not going anywhere in terms of the committees, but, but, the, part, but, the, but the party caucus in, in parliament seems to suggest that they're gonna move this forward. But there are other legislation that's also down, um, in, that's, that's before parliament, which raises concerns as well. And how does that then play to the kind of dynamics we spoke about in terms of the structural constraints, both in terms of policy inertia, but also legislation that could uh, have very deep implications for investors coming in, not just on the question of, 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 of what is our reaction to skills development, et cetera, but local procurement is gonna be very key. And then linked to all of this is the role of the tripartite alliance um, and, and how that plays out as well in the context of our foreign economic engagements, the deployment strategy, but also the link to industrial policy and our role in terms of are we opening up our market in terms of investment coming in, but are we doing this because we're also considering how uh, government is aligning to its own engagement with, with, with its tripartite alliance. And I'll leave it there because I think that's just some of the key points that I thought were interesting dynamics that we could expand on. Thank you, Irina. Thank you, Sanusha, so much for that. Let me just have a look at these questions that are coming in. The first question is directed to Menzi specifically and, and touching on a bit of, of what you are referring to in terms of policy, in terms of legislation. Um, I'm not sure if Menzi, you've had a chance to, to see the question on this side, but the uh, attendee is asking, what role would you attribute to structural weaknesses within the economy and attracting inward investments? I'm thinking labor market in issues, especially in terms of skills gap union and their political powers, um, primary resource dependence and intensity of the economy and share of global FDI and its technology intensity, Coming back to your critique of hatching out old policy gear, Askisa, Gypsa, etc. If we get to the politics right, if we get the, the politics right, sorry, um, how what are the low hanging fruit in your words? Would in, what kind of investments would come rushing in? Menzi, I just want to double check you there. Can you can you hear me, Irina? Yes, I can. And see you. me. Ah, 
I'm having a bit of trouble here. Um, but I did register the question from your discussion um, and I'll proceed to answer that. I think structural issues are a major impediment to investment in South Africa. And I think we've heard these being outlined by a number of interests that are eyeing out the continent or rather the country for investment and other broader multilateral institutions. We have heard structural impediments being noted by ratings agencies. We've heard them being noted by major companies that are looking at um, undertaking investments in South Africa. And key ones include unreliable public services. And the most integral one in this case is electricity, all right? The unreliable provision of electricity in South Africa has been denoted as the number one economic risk in the country by a number of rating agencies and financial institutions. And not only does it pose a threat on, on metrics like growth, on, uh, on, on metrics like productivity or productivity related metrics, but it also is a deterrent on anyone that's looking to come and put up a factory in South Africa. All right, we know how disruptive it is to a company's operation to not have reliable electricity. Another structural impediment is fiscal imprudence. All right, and the second and third round impact that might have on day-to-day -day business operations. Um, and then of course you mentioned the labor mismatch and uh, the skills gap, which is also another important structural impediment, right? Especially when it comes to finding the right people to employ in the right posts. And I think the more important question though, is how government has sought to overcome these issues and how it has, it has been conducive to alternate solutions. And it's quite interesting in the area of electricity, all right, and the area of load shedding in general. Up until recently, it was relatively um, unaccommodating to solutions that were put forward by the public or the private sector rather, by way of allowing for independent power production. And I think that reluctance by the government over the past couple of years has robbed South Africa of an immense amount of productivity, and it has also deterred investment into the country. Fiscal imprudence as well, because of political um, considerations, we have continued to persist with a, a bloated fiscus. And I think a misappropriation of financial resources to expenditures that have no growth return and no development and welfare return either. And when the private sector has sought to come in and aid in, uh, in resolving the labor mismatch, the government has also dragged its feet. So once again, we have seen the state play a, a own goal. And only recently are we seeing shifts towards the right direction. And we're seeing in response to these shifts, in response to a relatively prudent fiscal trajectory, and I guess signals towards reform, we are seeing investors bite the cherry, all right? And this is quite evidence or evident in, in Ramaphosa's investment drive. And some of the, the institutions that have expressed interest in coming back to South Africa and plowing capital or, or sowing capital into the country. And I think the more we, we, we tend towards resolving these, these, uh, these structural impediments, the more we also allow for private solutions to these impediments, I think we'll begin to see greater inflows uh, of, of, uh, of, of investment in a number of sectors. All right, and to answer Sanusha's question on the, on the investment conference, I think it was delayed to March 2022 um, because it happened to coincide with, uh, with, with COP26 last year in November. And we'll be looking um, quite intently at some of the agreements that, uh, that come out of that and whether or to what, to what extent Ramaphosa is able to to um, come closer to his goal of attracting a trillion rands uh, worth of investment. But again, this will largely be contingent on some of the gestures towards resolving some of the structural impediments that continue to beleaguer the country's economic prospects. Thanks so much for that, Menzi. I want to also now just ask Mamukete, there's a question directed for you, specifically referencing the green transition from a financial perspective. And I'm not sure if you're able to, to see the question. Have you seen the question? 
I have seen the question, but the question has got so many sub questions. <laughs> it's actually quite a quite an involved question. So um, bits of which I can address, and some of which I would be like going way out of like my my um, my my comfort zone. Please do. But go I've seen the question. Please do go ahead and address the bits that that are yeah. most pertinent to your expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the question really speaks to you know. Um, you know, there, there's money available for South Africa to invest in 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 um, in into green technologies. What is in it for South Africa, um, in my opinion? So, I mean, this is a question that South Africa is going to have to answer for itself. Um, you know, these things are never as straightforward as if this, then uh, then that. You really do need, um, I think, the the capacity to uh, uh, to think through these things um, and the policy capacity, the policy making. Um, capacity um, and and there, there's a lot of question marks around whether we have the ability um, within the within our department or at least the manpower to do the necessary um, calculations around what is the right thing for South Africa to do in the context of the green economy. What is clear though is that there is money um, being made available um, to facilitate the transitions, and it's not just for South Africa. Um, I think it's, it's it's for the whole world. Whether that, that is a sufficient cash or not, uh, whether countries need to be um, asking for, for more cash and under what terms, I think each country is going to have to, to decide for, um, for itself. So that speaks to the trend. But um, I think more importantly for South Africa is that um, there, there is a pushback against funding um, non-green technologies, so all technologies like coal, et cetera. Um, and in that context, then, if you were to um, want to invest in expanding, um, you know, coal um, or, or, or oil technologies, you would have to think really, really hard about where that cash is coming from. To the extent that um, our whole financial services sector is integrated into the global sector, we, we end up being under all the same sort of pressures. So, you know, getting cash to fund all technologies, um, I suppose that's my, my final thing, is that it's going to be really hard. So it's not clear to me that a country would have choices one way, um, one way or the other. In terms of, you know, um, we're still struggling with beneficiation. How are we going to go green? Um, is this a question of leapfrogging? And, and I think the, 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 you know, the, the person who asks the question actually answers the question for himself. So I am not a believer that there is a way in which development has to happen where you go A, a and then you go B and then you go C. Um, if you look at how we've adopted the use of tech, tech, um, technology, um, um, for instance, phones um, or computing, um, there's a lot of people who have never sat in front of a desktop but are using, um, you know, are using um, mobile technology. So you've adopted um, you've leapfrogged a whole stack um, in, in the adoption of computing. Um, so I think, uh, you know, you need to look at what are you trying to do? What are the, the options that are available to you? Um, and then you need to work um, with it on, on, on that basis. Um, I think the, um, the, last, the last sort of point um, is, 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 is around um, that, that is then asked is, is there an opportunity for, for South Africa? Um, I think we've, we've spoken a lot about, um, you know, the opportunities that South Africa has. And I think those are opportunities within, um, around, you know, getting more people employed, getting productivity higher, and getting this, this, this country growing faster, which um, I think we haven't even started to explore. Um, there's regional integration opportunities uh, and there's global integration opportunities that have all been sort of spoken about. And it speaks to each and every area of activity um, in, in the country, um, away from just the green transition, away from um, energy, um, in multiple, multiple levels. There's a lot that we can do to enhance both our welfare um, as well as become more competitive um, and, um, and, and, and actually, um, you know, grow faster um, to all of our, our collective advantage. Thanks, Malakete. If I could just have a follow-up to that, where does the just transition specifically fit into this, into this scope? I mean, we've covered the, the financial implications in a bit of a policy matrix on this side, but is this, is this where business is able to meet 
the needs of the public as well. Also, I mean, where does the public now start to fit into this? So my sense is that, Arena, you know, th this is th the trade-offs here. Um, there, there's going to be this displacement of people when you displace technologies. There's going to be disruption um, in terms of jobs. There are regions that are going to be heavily impacted by um, a move to green um, over whatever, whatever time period. Um, you, you, there's going to be some hurt somewhere. But um, this is the job of, um, of political principles. That's why they have the mandates that they have um, to try and figure out how you smooth the transition such that you, you minimize the hurt, ag acknowledging that you're not going to get rid of it completely, um, and you create other opportunities within those contexts. Uh, context such that uh, you know once you once your mining job is no longer there, um, you know, or you're you're you you're working um, in a in a, in a pipeline that supports a um, a power plant, for instance. That once that is no longer there, there is something else to do in that area. And I think I mean I mean this is obviously coming up more and more and more. There's this idea that the state needs capacity to think these through to make the necessary trade-offs, and those are inherently political. So if you have political dysfunction and you have technical incapacity, you're going to really struggle to, 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 make, um, to make those transitions. From a financing perspective, um, interestingly, you know, funders talk about ESG. So within that, there is, um, there is a social aspect to it as well. So, you know, you can still fund social projects, for instance, without actually, so you can still get funding to finance the transition and um, the accommodation of people so that people are not completely economically displaced in these, um, in these changes. Thanks so much, Mamukete. With that, let me, let me come to Diana and ask, and ask um, you, Diana, in the context, I mean, it's a similar, it's a similar train of thought where, where does the public fit into investment? You mentioned the continental free trade area specifically, um, but where does the public begin to engage these kinds of mechanisms specifically? I mean, much of the criticism towards the continental free trade area so far is that it's not localized enough. And that uh, there, while there is a move towards uh, localization or understanding how it is going to be, translated at that level, where does the public begin to become involved? Or is this just a center where established business or elite businesses in this case are only able to engage and take it further? Well, there's a lot of talk about how um, uh, the African free trade area will drive a uh, different kind of empowerment. It will help companies to grow and, and um, achieve um, uh, critical mass or greater crit critical mass and they're able to now but I think this question gets goes right back to uh, how is small business supported in in South Africa and and by all accounts it, it's not very well supported you know you've got a lot of you've got grants on the one side you've got big business on the other and there's this whole part is sort of in the middle where you know the are onerous um, uh, uh, obligations that small companies have to have to um, uh, tackle and and to survive and then of course we've got power issues and the cost of just the cost of everything that's going up in South Africa and and you know where you do have interventions to support small business often they they very targeted and there's maybe nothing wrong with that uh, per se but I think that it needs to be part of a broader picture you know make it easier for everybody including sm you know small business will be able to lift itself up uh, rather you know these targeted interventions are often quite difficult to access and they government run all of those kind of problems and this is not a um, this is not a new thing in, in, in Africa but what we are seeing is, is a real change in this uh, in approach and 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 the growth and, and investment interest in the, what they is startups in, in tech startups and how technology is is driving change and, and a lot of this tech these new technology companies are addressing long standing issues and road and 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 choke points and and so on in in doing business in Africa. Um, so that's one where the government should be focusing. You know what are the choke points here? How do we how do we unlock value for everyone by making it easier and cheaper? To, to do business and to and to succeed. Um, and you know, moving across borders is not not very easy. It's not cheap, and there's a range of export taxes and all sorts of uh, requirements and um, costs of moving goods around. 
um, border posts that are that are that are still blocked despite many years of trade facilitation. So you know this, the African free trade area is not just about um, some of the the high level issues that are that are being discussed by uh, by the secretariat, the CFTA secretariat and governments and so on. You know our government's really looking down at the bottom of the chain and seeing what they can do, not even just related to trade, but in terms of just doing business in general. And as I say, this is a this is an Africa wide problem. It's it's not, and and this is and yet everybody has a jobs crisis, but what are they doing about this you know it's it's it, it, it is a sense that government always wants to actively intervene rather than simply making the business environment easier and and perhaps um, investing themselves in in where it counts i mean that's just just my, off the top of my head thank you so much for that sorry i know that that i specifically asked you to speak on on bilateral issues and here i'm asking you to to weigh in on the continental free trade area um, there's been another another question from from the audience here, um, specifically for yourself, Diana. Where essentially, you know, the the gist of it is that where is the pragmatism for for South Africans seeing, you know, Africa as an opportunity for its own growth and prosperity? So it's it's looking at South Africa's um, South Africa's Gosh, me and words today. Uh, South Africa. <laughs> South okay, Africa. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you to interpret it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, South Africa's corporate, you know, um, persona across the continent, and uh, which sectors of the South African society need to take the lead in this narrative. So let me actually give you the whole question. If you're not able to see it, let me send it to you directly. Directly that side in the chat. So it's looking to it's looking to a number of elements, but it's trying uh, to. Oh, uh, sorry, I just see it now. All right, um, uh, third speaker. Okay, so um, much talk about African continental free trade area. South Africa, a country of fifty six million on a continent of one billion. What would it take for South African stakeholders to see Africa as an opportunity for its own growth and prosperity? Uh, which sectors of the South African society need to take the lead? Um, well, I, I, I think what, what you have already seen uh, is, is that South African companies have grown at home in, in order to service um, expansion across the continent. And, and what you're seeing is, is job growth in those countries, you're seeing skills training um, from uh, led by South African companies in some cases. They are big taxpayers. If you look at MTN, kind of money they're making, the kind of jobs they've created right through the sort of value chain. Um, so telecoms, I think, is, is obviously a, a big one. Um, I think there's, a, you know, so, so if you look at NAMPAC, for example, they've invested at home to in order to service their, their business in other African countries. Um, so that is serving uh, growth a, a, in South Africa. Um, and and there's, there's many other kinds of examples of that. But um, in terms of, so I think across the, the sector thing is across the board. What, what, what you're seeing is, is, is actually a pullback. We've seen a bit of a pullback by South African companies, not just in retail. We've seen, obviously, ShopRite is, is pulling back from its African uh, markets, and we've seen a couple of others. Uh, and I, I think these are, uh, this is maybe a, a reaction to COVID, the kind of percep perception of risk where if your business is too far away from you, um, supply chains and, and all of that that we've seen over the past two years. Um, and think people are feeling a little bit safer and uh, closer to home. But, um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that, the, that the, this, uh, yes, there's a billion people in South Africa can't solve all of these problems, but we are a big economy. We are still a big investor in the rest of Africa. What we could maybe be doing more of is sharing experience, sharing, um, you know, sort of doing, doing exactly that kind of engagement that the ANC foresaw right at the outship, uh, outset of, of its foreign policy after 94 is, creating partnerships and creating kind of different engagement that that is a win-win situation. I mean, there could be a lot more collaboration on a lot of the issues that, that we all are grappling with at the moment, like energy would be a big one. You know, the two biggest economies in Africa have huge energy dramas of very different sorts. You know, this is an area surely for some collaboration in terms of sharing of experience in our renewable energy um, and so on. So I, I think there's a lot more we could be doing. I think COVID, we, we really need to re-examine some of these relationships and how we engage um, to, to, to move forward after, after COVID. Hopefully there will be a, 
you know, the, the idea was that we would do things slightly differently at the end of COVID in the rebuilding phase. I'm not sure that's really happening. And, um, you know, I think countries are turning, looking quite, inward, quite inwardly focused, um, which, which I suppose is a natural response to, to a crisis. But um, I'm not sure that's good. I mean, the politics, the, 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 the politics is not good in, in, in many places. And, and so that's not going to help with the, with the growth project. So anyway, just, um, yeah, just some random thoughts on that. Thank you so much for that. And while we come to the last question I'm noting here, I want to direct it to Peter. Um, in the meantime, we will have time for another question. If, if anyone would like to, to come in with, with one more question, please do let me know. Please type it out. Or if you'd like to uh, raise your hand and also make the intervention like that, just let me know. Um, so in the meantime, let me come to Peter. There's a specific question about what role for DERCO. For those of you who don't know, DERCO is the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. Um, and in terms of policy certainty for good investment, uh, would be greatly enhanced if South Africa had an integrated energy plan as provided for in the, in, in the Energy Act in 2008. But this reduces space for arbitrage by political class, a coherent IUP would reduce the space for deal, for deal making, particularly in fossil fuel industries, but greatly enhance prospects for meaningful and favorable international investment in our uh, electricity system. Surely DERCO should weigh in and demand uh, the implementation of proper integrated energy planning? Question mark. Peter, what are your thoughts specifically yes. around that? Or rather, yeah. what role for DERCO at this point? Yeah, um, look, uh, before I get to Dirk, I mean, I, I do agree with that analysis that, that the kind of, you know, policy like energy policy or a whole range of other relevant policies are, are being dictated not so much in, in many cases by the interests of the country, but by the interests of, you know, of, of members close to power or in power. And so when I mean, we saw that in the, in the Zuma years where he was trying to promote nuclear energy for, you know, because whatever, you know, uh, um, for, for the sake of better relations with Russia or because it's big infrastructure and opportunities for, for massive uh, siphoning off of investment. We've seen coal, obviously, you know, had a big um, political uh, input through the Gupta zone in coal mines and, and, and so on. And, and one, one sees now Greta Mantasha is, is, is defending coal to the death and, and one wonders whether that's is there some commercial interest or is it, a, is, is, it, is it in the interest of labor because it's much more labor intensive, obviously, than, than renewable energy? Whether, whether Durka, I mean, Durka, I guess Durka, if you're talking about, for example, cabinet meetings where cabinet ministers can all chip into, into policy discussions, yes, that it, I, I guess Pandor should be telling the rest of her cabinet colleagues that it would be much better to sell investment if we had a coherent rational policy than, than everybody dipping in to look after their own interests. Whether Durka can do that or not um, is, is, a, is, 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 a, is a factor of relative power of different cabinet ministers in a particular administration. And I, I fear that Pandor does not have that kind of clout, but certainly that should be what happens. I mean, if, 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 if to make Durka's job more easier, that's the kind of policy that it should be given to sell. I'd, I'd leave it at that. Thanks so much, Peter. I think I, I just want to check out this, this latest message. Okay, it's, it's more of a comment. Okay, I see a question here um, by Mpumelo, Mpumelelo Ngula. Would you like to make this, this uh, intervention, you know, is, is this directed to? Okay, okay, this is directed to, to Menzi specifically in terms of gerontocracy. And I suppose this is something that can <laughs> be, be answered by, oh, by the panel. Boy. So, oh. Menzi, see that question. I, I cannot see that question, Arena, but I know that statement is quite controversial. Um, and, and I'm aware that it might ruffle a few feathers, but. I think it is a reality, you know, South Africa is somewhat of a gerontocracy, but I can't see the question. So if you don't want, if you don't mind reading it out, I would appreciate it. And uh, I'm happy to address it. 
Sure. Let me let me go with. Uh, so, how do we get our youth, who are mostly unemployed and many argue underskilled, to even make a contribution to South Africa being relevant in the world? Boy, oh boy, that is that is that is quite the question, and I think that is one of the fundamental questions of this this era. Um, I think the first thing is realizing that we do have a crisis when it comes to the youth. You know, um, the youth is becoming increasingly disenfranchised and disinterested in uh, in the political realm. Economically, they're becoming increasingly marginalized. We are less wealthy, I guess, and we have fewer prospects than preceding generations. And that's leading to all sorts of social ills. And I think we require a very serious consideration of this reality. And then the next step, of course, is to devise solutions. And I think we have to be a bit more creative with, uh, with our solutions. Previously, I mentioned the, 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 the dwelling on, on old and relatively outdated policy frameworks, which have some merit, but I think do not tap the full extent of South Africa's economic potential and its capacity to absorb the youth. Um, a few years ago, the, the UN spoke about something, or it spoke about the, the technicolor economy. And it, uh, it broke down the economy into around, I think, five different colors, a blue, green, gray, um, white, and I forgot the other one. But looking at other spheres of the economy that can potentially absorb um, a large youth core. And I think it's, it's, it's very important that our policymakers explore those avenues. And then, of course, there's the question of political gatekeeping. And, um, and the, the, the diversity of minds within the commanding heights of South African politics. Now, I think it would be very arrogant to say, as a youth myself, that old people don't have new ideas. But I think the fact that the average age of our politicians is above 60 is a cause for concern. All right. And I think their way or the way of viewing the world at, at that age might be somewhat... Uh, somewhat outdated. And I guess folks at that age tend to be somewhat more risk averse and less interested in hearing new ideas. And I think for the sake of innovation, for the sake of coming up with new policy ideas and fresh policy ideas, and for the sake of introducing a new perspective, it's important that we integrate more youth into leadership positions and put up structures that allow for the, the education and the integration of such youths. And I think the government, once again, cannot go this alone, all right? We need help from the public sector or the private sector rather through, through um, corporate social responsibility and other initiatives that help to educate youths and promote them to positions of, of, of influence. And I think through that, we can begin to diversify um, the, 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 the pool of minds in power and kind of whittle away at, uh, at, our, at our gerontocracy in South Africa that is not particularly serving us well. And those are, those are a few ideas uh, on, on my side. Thanks, Minzi. I see we have a last question quickly for Mama Kete. It's coming from Richard. Mama Kete, are you able to see it on your side? While it's not necessarily a question, I think, I think it's more looking towards... Um, improving African trade with, with the idea that uh, import tax will, will, will be an improvement in comparison to what the current, um, uh, in the current figures are with trade with the European Union, for example. So um, what are the kind of justifications around improving, um, I would say perhaps, African African trade in this context. Um, I can see I can see Richard's comments um, on SARS um, tech statistics, etc. Mm. Um, and then I see that the, my question is directed at, but I don't see the actual question. Let me see. What role? Um, where is the actual question? I don't think. Or it's, was it a comment? Is it, uh, is it the one about, there's a question, but a very surprising point from um, SARS, anti-text, text, text 
statistic report. The growing trade with Africa in 2021 was further emphasized with the selected trade block category, where the African Union was ahead of BRICS and the European Union as South Africa's top supplier for the first fiscal, successive fiscal year. Okay. Um, so it's more about that import export mm -hmm. um, relationships. Okay. Yeah. So if, if, if you look at um, the import export relationship, it's, it's been the case for um, quite a while, um, actually, that a lot of South Africa's exports go um, onto the continent. And that's, I think, been um, steadily increasing. That's a function, I think, um, of the fact that African economies themselves have been growing. Um, and, and, and that is something that um, South Africa should definitely take advantage of, um, is that African countries themselves have been growing, have experienced um, some of the highest growth globally. So, you know, you look at, um, you know, the boom bust um, sort of cycles that you see on the continent, but below that um, are stories of real progress um, and real development um, across um, across the continent that South Africa has been able to take um, to take advantage of. So to a large to a large extent, I mean, um, I think if you look at um, depending on the type of export that you're talking about. So we export cars, um, for instance, in, in big sizes. We export minerals, and um, what often happens is when you have mineral exports dwarfing. Um, the whole of the export sector, and that is very cyclical. It can often look like our exports are going um, somewhere else, but the more diverse things that we manufacture, so the more diverse parts um, of the of the of the of the pool of things that we manufacture um, actually end up on the rest of the continent, as opposed to being exported um, to to like um, you know the EU, which is a big a, a big importer, but they mostly import cars or Asia, which is a big importer, but they mostly import um, import raw materials. Thanks, Mamukecha. I think I think that, that touches on it. I just want to check, so she's got a hand up. Do you want to make a, a quick engagement? And then we're, uh, there's one yeah. more question for Anna, and then we're wrapping up. I think uh, I just want to pick up on the point that Mamukecha made about the, the import export. Just if any one of the panelists can give us a sense of what is South Africa exporting to which regions and what are we importing from the continent um, in terms of some of the products that are going into Africa uh, that, that talks about the numbers that Richard put out there from the report. Thanks. Okay, um, uh, Menzi, I see you've unmuted. Would you like to engage on that one? Okay, I, will, I want to actually direct that question to Diana, if that's okay. Um, All right, no problem. What are, your, what are your thoughts, Diana? Okay, I just caught um, the end of that, um, asking about what products are going in which direction, essentially. Um, well, I mean, it's a very diversified basket out of out of South Africa. We are the, you know, we're the most industrialized country, and there's a um, and and we um, export um, ready-made, probably the biggest exporter of ready-made um, or, or finished products, rather, um, in in Africa, um, competing, you know, quite fiercely with with other parts of the world, particularly China. Um, but also, I think South Africa's trade figures and Richard, who asked the who put the the information out there. Um, I, my impression is that a lot of the goods that go through into the rest of the continent go through South Africa for the mining industry, etc. Um, so I think there's a lot of engineering kind of heavy equipment and stuff that's recorded in South Africa's trade figures into the rest of Africa. Sort of coming this way, um, Nigeria, for example, and Angola are among our biggest fuel. Uh, uh, you know, we we import uh, crude oil from 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 um, the, these African countries. They're in our top uh, three or four. Um, in fact, I think Nigeria is is, um, is is one of the one of the few countries in Africa that doesn't have a trade that South Africa doesn't have the trade balance in its favor. But this is only due to the crude oil imports rather than a diversified basket. Um, but Africa, a lot of Africans will tell you it's quite hard to get goods into South Africa because of all sorts of phytosanitary and other requirements. So um, I'm not sure how much and what what the breakdown of that goods is there. But I think going out certainly. A lot of it is is uh, ready-made goods, as as well as fresh goods. A lot of our exports um, are, are going elsewhere in the world as well, from 
uh, fruit and all that from Cape Town and avocados, etc. So, yeah, I don't have the answer in my in my head uh, uh, readily. I have to say, but uh, I think those are just some of the bigger issues. Thanks so much for that. And I think with that, we're a couple of minutes over time. So let me take this opportunity to wrap up and um, just note that you know among you know these issues of operations and planning and political self-sabotage to use Menzi's phrasing. Uh, something we didn't really talk about was technocrat and bureaucrat fatigue, but it's something we've been speaking throughout the, about throughout the, the series. Another issue, you know, that we've touched on is the overregulated bodies and growing ad hocism as well. Um, unfortunately, if I could give a final prognosis on what we are seeing is that we are seeing temporary solutions in various situations and to an extent maybe a sense of band aid diplomacy uh, in, in, in certain times when it is actually much more viable to build a longer term uh, solution. But with that, let me thank again our panel for taking the time to be with us today. It is incredibly much appreciated to have you be here and share your experience and share your expertise as well. And to our, um, to our partner, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, thank you again for supporting us in this endeavor. And we hope to be in touch with you all in the coming months and hope to see you again as we engage you for South Africa and the world 2022. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Cheers folks, thank Th you very much. Thank you.